because of my ethnicity but after the man had left um, i just like burst into tears and long-term career plans and goals so the very very short hey friends welcome back to the channel so we've recently reached 25,000 on here which is crazy um i am so grateful for every one of you watching tuning in subscribing so as a thank you i hope to get to know you a little better through these videos and the comment section so that you can tell me what sort of content that really helps you um, and what you would like to see so you really came through with all the questions when i posted on instagram i was half expecting myself to create some questions so i've categorized them into different sections and you can skip them through because most of them revolve around like a theme the first theme is about personal questions so one of you has asked about my mbti which is essentially from what i understand it when i put it into google the 16 personalities quiz and to be honest, I have done this quiz many times and every time I did it, it was a different personality. Over the years, I find myself fluctuating between being more like introverted during a certain phase of my life and then now trying to be more extroverted or maybe I was extroverted all along, I don't know. Um, but in this phase of my life, I've been trying to put myself out there a little more really get out of the comfort zone and see what happens because I realize life is short and I don't know why I waffled about that but my MBTI is a protagonist ENFJT extroverted intuitive feeling and judging traits these warm forthright types love helping others and they tend to have strong ideas and values they back their perspective with the creative energy to achieve their goals. They feel called to serve a greater purpose in life while well, thoughtful and idealistic ENFJs strive to have a positive impact on other people and the world around them. These personalities rarely shy away from an opportunity to do the right thing, even when doing so is far from easy. So there you go. The next question is, what's your most happiest moment? I am missing my family a little bit more, so I would say my happiest moment was when I could spend time with them during Chinese New Year and and yeah missing family but at work there there have been loads of different like animals that I've been able to help and and that brings me joy as well and I suppose just being able to do this on my free time everyone knows you know that job is like stressful and things but I like finding ways to create little pockets of like happiness that I can look forward to don't know if that answers your question but there you go so bakute or naslema Ooh. I think I'm a bakute kind of girl. <laughs> if you know, you know. How did you have the confidence to start a YouTube channel? So I used to be very insecure. In final year, I was like umming and eyeing about starting a channel. And my main hurdle was my accent. As you can hear, my accent code switches. So a few years ago, I randomly managed to meet up with Ali, who is one of the super big YouTubers um, in Cambridge. Told him about this struggle and he just said, you are you you know I, I can't remember what he exactly said but basically something along the lines of like you know you are unique as yourself and you know you don't have to feel insecure about it because that's your accent like there's nothing wrong with that and I suppose that kind of validation just gave me like the green light and also after seeing so many other youtubers who are in other professions as well make a start just to share knowledge and it's really fun <laughs> so i decided to try and i suppose it was in my final year where things were very stressful personally mentally i think that was during covid as well i think that sort of helped made me realize that life is short if not now when and what do you have to lose so if you are thinking about starting a youtube channel i would definitely recommend just taking your iphone and filming it it's very low friction like very low barrier get comfortable speaking to the camera because it brings a lot of um, transferable skills i don't like that keyword but it honestly does it boosts your confidence it helps you speak more confidently and also have the boldness to you know learn new things and improve on your growth mindset showing yourself that you know oh this is something that i've never thought about before i'm going to learn about it and do it and then just do it and how is keith so keith is doing great he has finally settled into the flat initially he was very scared about the big windows i think because in my previous flat, flat we didn't really have like big windows so he was just overwhelmed with the amount of sunlight he was getting i suppose so next to more useful bits which is work experience and vet school applications how to get more work experience lots of places only take current vet students i do appreciate that is a real struggle because vet students also need to be 
shadowing vets and like undergoing training, their EMS placements and things. So don't give up, like you can definitely get work experience. At my clinic, we still take students, even like work experience students. For vet school applications, they focus more on like husbandry and getting to know you know how to handle animals and things but also like the insight into the profession so if you can prove that you are getting those insight through other medium that can definitely help boost your application as well but again work experience in-person work experience is a numbers game i will say just send a bunch of emails everywhere ring around a bunch of places and just present yourself as a super keen you know you really want to get into this Sometimes you have to use your connections if you have some uh, relatives or you know some friends in the area. But if you don't, just show up to the uh, not show up to the practice. Perhaps they're very busy, but send a bunch of emails, ring around, be really like intentional about your you know you really want to do this. Um, it's gonna be hard, like anything in life that you really want to do, it's gonna be hard. So when there's a will, there's a way. What subjects do you need to be good at veterinary? I'll say biology and chemistry is like a big one because most of the university's entry requirements uh, subjects that they require is like chemistry. I think maths, you don't necessarily have to be super good at, but um, it definitely helps when it comes to like dosage, counting and things. How to make your application stand out for ChemVet? So make your application stand out for Cambridge. Definitely focus on your entrance exams because they're very um, key on that and also your interview and basically <laughs> don't leave anything to chance so try to boost your application as best as you can for cambridge i remember it can be dependent on like the type of college you go to as well so definitely go and visit the college if you can have an open day speak to some students who are already there if you can just to see what the vibe is like and i definitely have a video dedicated to like cambridge vet school and things i think i have three different videos about it so make sure you catch them on the playlist in my channel how did you know you wanted to be a vet so this is definitely in my personal statement i suppose just growing up being exposed to like different stray animals living in the city we couldn't have pets because typical asian parents so maybe part of me tried to rebel against my parents and be like i'm gonna be a vet you can't do anything about it <laughs> um but jokes aside through doing more work experience with the clinic zoo and also animal shelters made me realize that we do need to be a voice for these animals and there's lots of human doctors out there there's not enough vets and when I entered the profession, there was not enough vets. When I left vet school, there's still not enough vets. So we do need vets out there to help these animals. And not only just like pets, really, like farm animals, working in wildlife, endangered species, and also public health, things like, you know, COVID and stuff. I feel like the older I get, I realize that how intertwined we are between our environment and our animals and the whole One Health concept. It's not a new concept and I find that the more we realize that how interlinked we are and how important it is for all of us to have this knowledge to be able to live like more harmoniously with our environment and our animals, the better the world can be. So I do think, yeah, more people should be vets still. What is something that is required personally to be a vet in your opinion? Um, resilience, lots and lots of resilience and adaptability, I would say. You will be faced with lots of challenges because pets come to you and they are sick, unwell or like animal cruelty and you will feel helpless a lot of the times when it comes to difficult situations, um, you know, with the XL bully ban and the puppy farms in the UK, all of these animal issues and also the vet bashing on social media. I think every profession has its hard bits, um, but in a vet profession, definitely resilience, adaptability and also time management because you will be very busy in your day job. What goals did you plan up before entering university in order to be a vet? When I decided that I want to go to vet school, I really looked at so many different universities all across the country, went to a lot of educational fairs, and I had a goal of like doing all the work experience if, when I can. So calling up different places, go to the clinics, zoos and things. And that was back when I relied heavily on my friends who came with me on work experience as well, like to the zoo, so that we could all learn together and yeah, that was, that was such a long time ago. And also exams, so I made sure that I was doing all the entrance exams, studying for them, speaking to people who have done them. It's weird, so I honestly feel like when you not manifest or manifest, when you manifest something, you really find ways to get it and also the universe really helps you in that sense. You definitely need to put in the work, but if I go back to my 17, 18 year old self, I was really, really focused on 
getting into vet school and plans just fall into place like I had a, a friend who knew another friend who went to this university and then they gave me some advice and then I met my senior on Facebook who also gave me loads of advice on it and it just felt like everything moved very smoothly um, but obviously I had to study for the exams as well okay stopping the waffle Next section, studying at vet school. When studying, what subjects gave you the most trouble? Hardest to get your head around? Oof, I want to say statistics. We had like a whole module on evidence-based medicine, which was very interesting. But when it comes to the statistics part, it just took me a while to understand like your different analysis, statistical analysis tests. I suppose not very relevant in the clinical sense, but like in the research side of things, it was a bit tricky for me to wrap my head around. In terms of more clinical topics, I would say anatomy initially. I think I struggled a lot in the first two years of vet school. And it's only sort of in clinical years where I was having a bit more fun. So yeah, things that really helped me were speaking to my friends and group study sessions. So that's what got me through vet school. Tips for vet students in final year. Oh, so exciting. You are in final year. Um, I think have the most fun in final year because that's it. Like when that goes, you enter the workforce and that's it. Try not to panic too much about applying for jobs. Honestly, the job market would appreciate that at the moment. So do the work, like you still have to do the work. You can have fun, but make sure you still are on top of your revision, which I'm pretty sure you will be. Don't be too hard on yourself. You know, don't burn out before you enter the profession pace yourself, be kind to yourself, get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. I will say during exam times is very like stressful, but if you manage to practice those things to manage the stress, if it's like exercising or journaling, eating healthy, get all those habits down so that you can succeed in your exams and you can definitely take all those skills to help you cope in your work life as well. A good book is The Obstacle is the Way, which is what uh, one of my mentors recommended by Ryan Holiday. I was listening to the audiobook throughout my exams and job interviews and things because it was a very difficult time and that book really gave me encouragement so I would recommend that. How many years of studying in university did you take to become a vet? Six years, which is standard for Cambridge. What's your background? Oh, I covered this all in a video. <laughs> I will just link it here. Any books you recommend? Oh, I just answered that. The Ryan Holiday book. And also there was this book by Dave Nicole, I think. So you're a vet, now what? And it just goes into a bit of like communication skills and things. I will link it down as well so you can have read. And how did you know your heart lay in the vet profession as a student? I don't think I knew my heart lay in the vet profession. I'm gonna interpret it as when I was at vet school, I knew that I needed to just finish my exams, you know, make sure I learn all the knowledge that I can, gain the experience and then graduate. But now coming into the vet profession, I just realized it's very, very different in terms of like expectations and things. And if I interpret it as like, how did you know I want to go into clinical work instead of non-clinical work? I would still recommend everyone to try clinical work for at least like a few months if you really think that you're not suited for clinical work because you don't know until you try is what I would say. In clinical work, I found that I really love helping people and I love seeing the joy on their face and their animals when they get better. It's very rewarding for me. So yeah, okay, I think I'm running out of time. I have to clean up and evacuate this place. So we'll continue this video in a second. And we're back. So we'll continue answering your questions. The next section is about current vet life. So one was discuss the time that you had to deal with a difficult client and how you handled it. So story time, I was three months into my first practice, like first ever job. And there was just a very angry client. Lots of misunderstanding, have never seen this client before, but they were upset about something else. And then they came in and started shouting and shouting and shouting. So I used communication skills as best as I could to just try and not escalate the situation, you know, very pragmatic, being like, okay, you can have your complaint being handled on and passed on to our manager. We will look to rectify it. But after the man had left, um, I just like burst into tears and had to have a sit down for a few minutes before going back into consult. It was horrible to feel that way. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge those feelings and let it like go through you and, and, and feel them. Like don't suppress them. It was really good that the head nurse was there, that she gave me um, a pep talk essentially, like, and also like talked it through. Most of the times clients are not personal. Um, they're just angry because their pet is sick and also because of prices or their financial situations and things. 
and just try not to take it personally although it's very hard I know it's like how, how can people hate me I just work here um, but no you have to realize that uh, how upset people are is not a reflection of you it's a reflection of them and you can only do your best by you know focusing on a pet and like wanting to help the pet so after that the we had to see the client for a few more times because their pet was getting progressively unwell and not responding to the treatments and things. After discussing with my seniors, obviously have a supportive practice that will definitely support and guide you along the way. Um, but you also have to take like ownership and also pull up your big girl pants and after you've cried a lot about it, compose yourself and then when you're more calm, take ownership of the case and also continue speaking to the client. Um, Obviously, if the client is very abusive, then that's a whole different situation. But, you know, if you have one or two um, tricky clients, you know, it's worth to take up the challenge, but obviously with a supportive practice, basically. How do you stay current with the changes and updates in veterinary care? So generally, you tend to get emails from like RCVS or BVA, or if you follow newsletters like Clinician's Brief, for example, and Facebook groups on Vet Wings, Veterinary Voices UK, people tend to discuss things on there. And um, newsletters is a really good one to keep up to date with the news. And speaking of, I am in the process of creating my own newsletter where I share vet stuff, study things, and also personal development things. So if that is up your alley, be sure to sign up in the description box below. Oh, and also if you don't already follow the So You Want To Be A Vet podcast, we talked about some uh, current hot topics, things in the news as well. So you can have some information there. Oh, and also CPD. I realize there's lots of things. So CPD is continuous professional development. So basically it's a requirement that you have to at least complete 35 hours a year, I think, and depends on what level you are at. And basically you sign up to courses, go to congresses like BSAVA Congress, London Vet Show, and that's where you see all the updates that's happening in the veterinary profession, in your exhibits, and also online talks, basically. What do you like the most about your job? I would say people and their pets. Honestly, I just get so much joy out of speaking to people about their pets and also ways to help improve their pet's life. Literally the other day I was talking to a client about brushing their cat's teeth and they were like, oh, I didn't know you need to brush your cat's teeth. And I was like, yes, you do. And so it's very interesting and I do enjoy being able to help them. And also the satisfaction of seeing your pet come back and feeling and looking much better. Um, especially dental cases when they have like a really sore mouth and after you do the dental treatment they come back and the owner is like oh wow and um, they can't stop eating now they're very happy they're they're more lively they want to play more that's because they're not in pain which is very good so yeah how do you deal with scared or aggressive pets so there are a number of levels and i spoke about this a bit more in the new grad video i think basically fear-free practices if you don't really know that sarah heath has a really good talk about uh, describing the sinker model in dogs um, basically trying to reduce things that can cause them to be very like stressed or upset. If they are really too stressed by coming into the clinic, use your medications like gabapentin and trazodone to take before coming into the practice. So it makes them more chilled out, anti-anxiety, and so that they remember that, oh, this is actually not a scary place. If they're really upset, I would encourage things like socialization visits, coming to the nurse, nurse clinics just to get a treat and be way, things like that to improve their confidence. But if it's a really aggressive pet and we need to check their pets urgently, we may need to sedate them so that it's safe for the pet and for us to check them. How do you communicate critical conditions to their owners? So this one will definitely come with practice but some tips that I found personally oh and there's also lots of like communication CPD online that you can definitely find but really try to understand how you would want to receive the news from the pet owner's point of view so I know initially when I started out I always want to make sure that I get the condition across and be like okay this is specific specific cancer lymphoma whatever and then you have to understand that you know the owner doesn't really care what the name of the disease is half the time they just want to know what it means for their pet and like will their pet get better and what the options are and also when you relay all of this information try to slow down your pace because when you tell the pet owner that their dog has like a grave diagnosis, their world tends to stop. And you know, if you can imagine if it happens to your own pet, you're not gonna be able to process all those information as much as you would like to. There's a lot of um, debate on this. Like, do you tell the good news first or the bad news first? 
it really depends. I tend to go straight to the point because I find that owners appreciate that, you know, if their dog or cat has like kidney failure, they want to know about it first before the other results that you've done the tests on. I hope that helps. And also, most importantly, is simple terms. There's a lot of times where clients are like, oh my gosh, this vet just uses jargon. So I would think of explaining it to like a 10 year old or a five year old, that kind of way. So what are common health issues in dogs or cats? This is so broad, I think. It really depends where you work and which area you work in. So for me, as a GP clinic, I tend to see um, lots of like health check patients and things, patients coming in for like lameness if they accidentally hurt their foot. Vomiting and diarrhea, very common in dogs and, and also cats. Um, things like that. So if you are asking in the context of trying to prepare for your first vet job, a good place to start for a small animal is the top 100 small animal consultations book. Just have a flip through, see what the common conditions are, just to get an idea. Have you ever faced um, discrimination from your client? So um, I do get weird looks in the consult and every now and then people are like, oh, your accent is so interesting, where are you from? And I just tell them, most of the time, people are just curious. I did have one or two that um, sort of refused to see me um, because of my ethnicity. And uh, it did sting a little bit initially, um, because partly because I thought I did a really good job to look after their pet. But I think I just have to realize that people are entitled to their own opinions and it's up to you to be as affected as you want to be. Obviously, discrimination because of like ethnicity and things is bad uh, and it's not great. Um, that said, yeah, I think it's just bad. There's no but, I think it's just bad. Don't let it affect you because, you know, at the end of the day, you know that you're doing a good job and, and you have loads of other clients that really appreciate you for your work and it shouldn't matter how you look like or who you are, really. How did you find your vet mentor? So I have a few mentors that I really look up to and basically I just send messages out into the universe. I Google <laughs> any vets in sort of like my area or like in my area of interest and then message them on social media and things and they're always very happy to give advice and also um, yeah share their knowledge so definitely would encourage you to do that if you have a someone that you want to message to get some advice just send a message if they don't get a response so let's say they're very like busy and things if you you know listen to their podcast consume their content get some inspiration from them that's another indirect way of mentorship as well i find it can be quite useful i want to become a vet but i'm scared i might not be able to handle stress with all the stress in this industry oh boy there's a lot of stress um do you regret becoming a vet so i don't regret becoming a vet not yet, I suppose, but I don't regret becoming a vet. Every job will come with its challenges and I suppose it's just what kind of challenge you want to take. Not having challenges is also a challenge because I would imagine you would feel a bit bored with life if you don't have any downs. You won't really have any ups, that kind of thing. So yeah, I don't, I don't regret at the moment. Obviously, it's not for everyone, so if you feel like you're a vet and you don't feel like this job is right for you anymore, then you have your vet passport. You can leave and diversify. There's like groups on Facebook, vets, it's literally called Vets Stay Go Diversify, VSGD. And look for other opportunities. Is it a norm to be able to claim back OT hours in lieu? No, unfortunately, well, not in my case. I've never been able to claim any overtime because I've accepted that it's the nature of the job. And I think it depends on your contract. I know for some other veterinary staff, like um, my nurses and also support care staff, I think they can claim overtime, but not for vets. And just because I think the salary package and things supposed to account for those overtime. Um, obviously try to finish on time and don't bring work home, but due to the nature of the job, you tend to take some work home um, but yeah it has to be a balance so you know so last section is on future plans careers and goals everyone is very interested in this what other ways to become a specialist in the uk and how much does it cost love from hk oh love from hong kong 
There are two main ways to specialize in the UK. The first way is if you become a certificate holder or achieve a cert AVP status. You enroll in this certificate alongside your full-time job and it can cost from 6,000 to 10,000 pounds in total, depending on what subject area. And then you pay another thousand pounds to sit the Synoptic exam. You can do it at University of Liverpool, Nauticum, RVC or Improve or BSAVA. It can take two to 10 years to complete and you generally do that alongside your full-time job. The second way to do it is to become a board certified specialist where essentially you do one or two internships at a teaching university or a hospital rotating through different specialties or a specialized one and then the salary for the internship is more like a scholarship or a stipend so it is a pay cut essentially it is about nineteen thousand pounds a year for rvc and most places encourage you to have a couple of years working in first opinion practice so you know what cases go through the door. Then you apply for a residency program that lasts about three years, which is very, very competitive. And you can do it at a university or a private referral hospital. In final year, I remember seeing the residents working really hard alongside the specialists, doing ward rounds, journal clubs, and also teaching us as well. And they can be 10 to 14 hour days. The pay is generally a bit lower, so £28,000 starting salary at University of Liverpool and once you finish those three years, you sit the board of exams and achieve the RCVS diploma or ECVS diploma to get your board certified specialist status. Would I ever consider doing a subspecialty like cardiology or oncology? So at the moment, I'm still trying to figure out what is right for me. I'm really interested in like doing like cardiac scans and things like that and also chemotherapy. I just feel like veterinary medicine is so wonderful. You have so many things that you can do. And at the moment, it just feels like general practice seems very interesting to me and um, I don't think I will go down the board diplomat like the internship residency route just yet because I feel like that would be very intense and fair play to those and huge respect to those people who do it um, but I just feel like with the limited amount of time I feel like I have on this earth I don't know I'm just <laughs> trying to figure out what would be the best um, and I haven't found a specialty that I really, really love to go like full in, to specialize in that area. At the moment, I'm really enjoying being like a general practitioner. So yeah, so there are a few questions and I'll group them all together about any plans in the future to do a post-grad cert or specialize? Will you stay a vet working in practice, a hospital your whole career? Future plans as a vet, stay in the UK or travel abroad? Long-term career plans and goals. So the very, very short-term career plan and goal is I'm currently undertaking a post-grad certificate in animal nutrition and also undertaking a course in veterinary acupuncture, which is happening next week, which I'm really, really excited about. And these are certificates that I just do alongside my full-time job. Um, and it's not as intense as like an internship or residency thing, but it's enough to keep me occupied with all the deadlines, exams and essays really enjoying it at the moment. I feel like I'm exploring the other side of veterinary medicine, things of using more um, like a holistic approach to managing like conditions because nutrition plays a huge role. I feel like so under underestimated or just it's not being made of a big deal basically compared to like your other specialties but nutrition is so important we eat and we need to eat right to live right and with the veterinary acupuncture course it's still early days but i definitely want to share more um, when i really get into it about the findings and the research and the evidence base behind it as well i'm also really keen to look at opportunities abroad so doing like a short trip to help the wildlife or endangered animals in different countries or even like a spay neuter clinic to help the stray population um, in other countries i think it's really meaningful and also a really fun holiday i suppose like a working holiday while you practice your skills well and also see different countries learn about different cultures i think having the vet degree will definitely um, benefit you to go on all these adventures and I suppose it's just in this period or this era, I, I guess two to three years out, I see a lot of my friends like undertaking certificates and internships and things. So it's really cool that you get to make these decisions at this stage of your career. So the main goal for me at this moment is to improve my skills in all aspects in veterinary or even in life and things just getting better at things and see where that takes me. So from things like doing this YouTube channel, sharing my knowledge and educating others and also practicing speaking on like camera, things like that, that's a really good skill. And also in a veterinary job, 
being more good at like your surgery, dentistry, um, x-rays, ultrasound scanning and things, I feel like it will it will keep me busy because there's so many things to level up at and I think it's pretty cool that you know you have this opportunity to level up in the ways you want to and um, I hope this video will give you some inspiration for yourself as well to look at yourself as the main character in your main character phase and pick the things you want to learn at and the good thing about working at a vet practice is that they will pay for your CPD so that you can learn and grow in the ways you want to um, or in the ways that would help your practice <laughs> as well. Would you want to be an exotic animal vet? So exotic animals is definitely very interesting and unfortunately in my practice, well no my current practice do get a fair share of ferrets and um, do we have any ferrets, rabbits, things like these but not so many um, like tortoises, reptiles, things like that. It's definitely an area that I wouldn't say no to, but at the moment, just because of the caseload that we have at the practice, um, I don't see many of those. But it'd be really cool to be an exotics vet. So I think that's it for questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch and also ask questions. Really excited to get to know you guys a bit more. So let me know what your MBTI is in the comments and also where you're from and if you're a vet student or a vet or not, it'll be super cool to get to know you. And as always, take care, stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.